Hey guys, oh, what is up? <laughs> Welcome to another episode of the Poker News Podcast. We are live from the E-Stars Lounge here at the World Series of Poker. I got myself a Yerba Mate. Or Yerba Mate, where we're still the pronunciation is to be decided. Yerba Mate, if you are a <laughs> Jeff Platt recently come from San Antonio. Um, anyways, this is not sponsored by them, but it is in fact sponsored by Global Poker, which is the fastest growing poker site in i want to say in the united states you can play in the united states this is a relatively new partnership we will keep you guys posted but we wanted to go ahead and just get it out there if you are in the u.s and you want to play poker they have a sweepstakes based model so you can play poker online outside of i think say new jersey nevada and the places where you can play on wsp.com this is jeff platt Hello. I'm Sarah Herring. There's going to be two versions of this action going on. One is happening right now on a live feed on Facebook Live slash PokerNews.com. The other one will be happening in an audio format, so there may or may not be some times where we have to say we're pausing, which in real life will only be a pause for a few seconds. Mm -hmm. but in, Crazy editing technology nowadays. Know, <laughs> it's the future. <laughs> yeah. I'm Sarah Herring. This is Jeff Platt. Let's just get into all the action. So since we last spoke to you, what's up, David, by the way? Since we last spoke to you, we have a bracelet in Elia Lesra, who really, in terms of this field, it was a who's who in the mixed game world. And I think really anyone could have taken this one down. But since you just spoke to Elia Lesra a couple weeks ago, does it feel like his game is just super spot on? Yeah, it was crazy. You know, you talk to a lot of players before the summer and they're like, okay, yeah, I'm going to have a good series, feel good, you know, because of X, Y, and Z, I'm just going to crush it this summer. Ellie very specifically said, I'm going to win a bracelet. It's going to be my fourth bracelet overall and my third bracelet in stud. He specifically named a stud event. So there are only two stud events, the 1500 and the 10K. And he just ships the $1,500 seven card stud event for his fourth bracelet, for his third stud WSOP bracelet. He beats our guy Anthony Zeno heads up, incredibly talented player. Uh, Val Vornick, who finished in third, Rep Porter in fifth, David Singer in sixth, Scott Seaver in eighth. So like you said, these mixed games are going to draw some pretty stacked fields, maybe not as stacked as they could potentially be. We'll get to that in a little bit. But for Elio Lezer, this has got to feel good because for the last year, he's probably been on this roller coaster ride of sorts, right? So he releases a book and everybody's excited because this book is coming out, the English version. Shout out Robbie Straczynski for translating that. Um, and then... You know, a couple people come out and they say, well, Ellie owes me money. And then Ellie says, this actually isn't the point. What's up, Steven? Um, you know, maybe I owe a couple people, but we have things worked out. And he seemed to have come out of that okay. But the emotional ride that he had to have been on just had to be absolutely insane. And so to pounce on this first seven-card stud event and win a bracelet, I, I just can't imagine what he's feeling right now. It's... I think especially, yeah, you, you're looking for validation. You're looking for the poker mm -hmm. community to sort of welcome you back in. And if nothing else, that you can get the respect that you feel like you deserve at this point in your career. And he actually had won this bracelet. I want to say it was in 2015, but he had won this exact bracelet already before. And during his, his interview with uh, Oliver Viles, he, no, with Will Shilliber, I'm sorry, on PokerNews.com, he said, Stud is my game. Yeah. Like, all these players are sick players. All these players, you know, might be able to beat me on any given Sunday, but stud is my game, and this is <laughs> this is the bracelet that I'm going to come and win. And uh, briefly, I want to shout out, we've got our boy Eric Steinbaugh in the chat who donated a kidney to the mother. Oh, Eric Steinbaugh, Eric yeah, Steinbaugh. Yeah. Oh, awesome, awesome, awesome. He donated a kidney to the mother of someone whom he had dealt to for years in Florida. He already went through the surgery just a couple weeks ago the surgery went great so i wanted to give a big shout nice. out to eric boss hero and he says he's flying in tomorrow feeling good so we'll for sure catch up with him in a video if we can which i'm sure we can for eric sure. you just got to come come get a hold of your lady and shout out to everyone by the way we're like scrolling through the chat i see everything what's up oliver what's up everybody saying hi to the auntie i love it um but let's we're gonna we gotta keep things moving since we do have the audio version of this podcast as well oh my gosh this is one of my favorite stories of the wsop so far i shouldn't be backing up like this we got to stay in with oh, yeah, the mic careful and don't fall off this, these chairs are a little wobbly yeah. so we want to want to see pregnant sarah straight. go down for the count <laughs> yeah. um so jim betchel he just won the uh, 10k deuce to seven championship and he already won a main event now yeah. 
I love thinking of these guys as say like the old school yeah. guys who were winning, you know, back in the day. And I think I, if I remember correctly, there was something like 271 players um, in that field. I hope I, I might. It sounds weird when I say 271. We're talking about the deuce to seven, so hopefully I'm not wrong. But <laughs> I may or may not be. This field, the 10K deuce to seven, had 91 players. He was. It's. He set a record for being the longest player with bracelets the longest separation in between two bracelets <laughs> which was what 26 years i want to say yeah, 26 yeah. years and am i the only one that when it said 26 years i was thinking oh yeah like the 70s or something right or the 80s when it said 26 <laughs> years i was like dude oh, no. 1993 was 26 <laughs> years ago what we are getting old really fast but a huge congratulations to to jim betchel and actually when i walked by that final table mm -hmm. if i have to be honest with you didn't even notice or recognize him because the final table was so sick. Yeah, I would say so, and it made for a very entertaining broadcast as well. Whenever you have Jean Rivera Balland at a poker table and there's a camera on him and there's a microphone on him, you know you're going to be pretty entertained. And I think um, he lived up to kind of the hype that we felt going into that event. You also had Paul Volpe, who's just a boss in all of these 10K events. You have Perlod Friedman, who I think is regarded as one of the best No Limit Deuce to Seven players out there right now. Darren Elias, who just crushes absolutely everything. You had Pedro Bronfman, I wasn't familiar with the name, but he actually did the music for Narcos, very popular series on Netflix. So it's like everybody had something. You had Vince uh, Musso, another one of these old school guys, and then our guy Jim, who takes it down. He just kind of comes out to the series here and there. He fires the main. He fires the Deuce to Seven. He goes home, and that's pretty much it. Like, he just doesn't play that much he went deep in the main in 2015 he finished in 121st place and Sarah like this guy was just a boss during play I mean he made some absolutely sick bluffs that the commentators Ali Najad and Randy Earl did not necessarily expect and he made some sick value calls and value bets as well um, he was he was just fantastic he put on quite the show and it's hard to imagine even how I'm always trying to understand how people stay on their game living in the United States, playing in a in a game like Deuce to Seven. Mm -hmm. Where are they spreading right, that? Where right. are you finding this? <laughs> how are you able to you know to find edges and to, and to keep your game sharp? And so, I mean, a huge congratulations, obviously, to all those guys, but especially to Jim Butchel. I mean, I think that's just it's just such a great story. Yeah, he says it's the toughest true poker game, and we hear that a lot about Deuce to Seven. It's just poker at its purest form, you know. There's a pre-draw round of betting and a post-draw round of betting, and that's it. And I'm just, there are no community cards. Do you have it or do you not? Do I have it or do I not? You know, it's just like, it's poker at its simplest form, which can also make it, like, extremely difficult. But it's all about, it's all about these soul reads, which I think makes it really a lot of fun to watch. Absolutely. Uh, now, earlier today, we had a bracelet ceremony for Jordan, D-E-N, mm -hmm. that's right, for Jordan Fox, who is welcoming a child in August and he won the 1k double stack it was so awesome to see him and he was clearly supported on his rail by his family and that was one of the most incredible parts of the story was him talking about how him and his family do this every year as sort of like the family reunion right like they make this their thing so he said it started with him and his dad coming every year then it, as his brother got old enough to play him his dad and his brother then he's saying his uncles started joining in and so i always feel like being able to share in, in these incredible moments and then doing it with your family makes the story just so... Okay, I'm yeah. pregnant. Let's get yeah. serious. <laughs> and, and Jordan had his pregnant wife at home, eight months pregnant, watching via, it seemed like, cell phone from Jordan's dad at the time. So when he won, I mean, she must have just went absolutely insane. The family was going insane. I heard uh, Donnie Peters mention this on the Fives podcast, but like, they were so locked in on the bracelet. Like, it's so easy for us to focus on the money. I mean, he won $420,000 yeah. off of a 1K buy-in, his biggest score. And all they could talk about was bracelet, 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 which shows, to your point earlier, that this is like the family really caring about the World Series of Poker. These are the stories that we, that we love to see, especially you. <laughs> at this time of the year. You know, you know how I do, yeah, yeah, you know yeah. how mama does. And actually I, I thought about you when I was interviewing him because he just last year had taken 27th in the main event. And I know when you took, you know, 36th, yeah. that was really hard for you. Just keep jacking that place up, yeah. <laughs> and, but he was talking about really just how devastating it is. He says, you know, like of, like of course you're walking out of the Rio 
with 250k or what you know whatever yeah. it was 240 something k and and he said you can't imagine what it's like to win two hundred forty thousand dollars and be like the saddest person leaving the rio in the world and um it, it to actually capture a bracelet to be able to have that experience versus most of us will never have the experience of being on day six of the world <laughs> series of poker main event but you know he said as, as happy and as wonderful as that moment was that it's absolutely nothing you know this this winning a bracelet just blows blows it out of the water and he also had he spoke a lot about different spots where things completely you know i think it's something that you know poker players always say oh you know it takes luck and it takes skill but he spoke about several times where he easily could have been out and having such yeah. a deep deep respect for his um opponent who busted in third place uh, who i want to say was jeff smith mm -hmm. and some spots where jeff made moves on him that he had he had a real deep respect for for jeff and there was in fact a spot where he got it in all in um ace queen versus aces and you know queen and then queen and easy game and, yeah exactly <laughs> but i you know i appreciate that, that being realizing that this it could have easily gone a, a different way yeah and I, I mean look at this picture from haley on poker news on the poker news article you can see him and his dad and they're just like absolutely stunned like the moment had not set in that it, or maybe the moment did set in and that's why they were so stunned that he had won a World Series of Poker bracelet. Like they're just, they're, it's, it's indescribable what they're going through at that moment in time. And that, again, it's just what makes it so, so cool. That's what the World Series is all about. Like you don't really get that in other tournaments. You really don't occasionally once in a blue moon you do, but at the World Series, you have a lot of first time, not only first time bracelet winners, but first time tournament winners. And it means, that much more when it comes here at the Rio. Well, for those who are watching live, you won't get to see this, but for those who are going to be checking this action out um, in the audio format, I'll go ahead and put in what Jordan Fox had to say during his bracelet win today. Hello, everybody. I am with Jordan Fox, who won the 1K double sack no limit last night. Now, they had to add an extra day. This was an incredibly huge field, which of course meant that it was a very solid top prize, more than $420,000. So first of all, I have to just give you the, the very basic congratulations. Thank you, thank you. It was the best run ever. First bracelet, couldn't have been a better time either. Which, for those who don't know out there, Mama Bear is expecting. This guy's about to welcome a child a month from now, right. so I, I fully, can tell. <laughs> he's, he's, he's so fit, but I fully understand, you know, the, the added pressure and yeah. the, the excitement, all of it going on. And so for those who missed it, tell us a little bit about what your plans were for the summer and how incredible this win is. So I've been coming to the World Series for like 11 summers in a row. And um, I had a pretty deep run last year in the main event, which was my best run to date for sure. 27th BTW. And, uh, yeah, is that it? 27? Anyway, um, so I can only play exactly three tournaments this summer. And the first two didn't go very well. And this was the third tournament of three. And it was, I considered it my main event. So I put that mentality towards my play and everything like that. And, um, and I won it. it was and I won it. And she's having a baby next month. And it couldn't have been better timing. I mean, it's just a dream come true. It was meant to be, and for those who can't see, he has his family just on the other side of the camera, which I think is, is something so special to be able to share this, not only yeah. with your, your wifey and coming baby, yeah. but also with your family. So talk to me a little bit about what that moment was like to be able to share with them. So yeah, my, my dad and I especially have been coming every year together. It's been our thing since I pretty much stopped playing baseball, you know, about 10, 11 years ago. So and I'm, since my brother's gotten old enough, he's come. My cousin Mark, he's been coming with us too, and we've been like a little team. And uh, when he went deep in 2015 in the main event, I railed him, stood up for three straight days, and uh, I, got, I had the same back that he's feeling now after standing up for me for the last couple of days. But, um, but yeah, I mean, yesterday when we were at the final table was when things really got exciting, not just for me, but for the rail. Because they, not only could they have a hard time seeing the action, but they could only judge what was going on based off my reactions to them. So I, every now and then I'd shoot him a glance. Like they, that means like, I, you know, check this one out. You know what I mean? Be here with me. Yeah, and they and they were right on tune with what I was sending them and everything like that. And um, the, ta the final table was smooth and um, a little couple of bumps heads up, but um, I think within a half hour it was over. And I just remember throwing my arms up like in triumph, and then my dad and brother and cousin just come busting through the rail, and we just grab each other and. 
We heard you, by the way. I was on the other side yeah. of the Amazon, yeah. and I heard you. Which those are actually, you know, those are the moments that that <laughs> poker is about. That's what it's what yeah. it's all about. And I wanted to ask you, you know, for most people, getting as deep as you did last year in the main event is the goal is i mean there's yeah. so much anticipation once you get to day six it's like the whole espn is all over you on day six too so i want i saw the light at the end of the yeah. tunnel but it's still very far away at that point so i was really happy with my run considering i've never had one cash in the main event with six other tries that's how hard it is and um so it, it's so weird and every poker player can attest to this once you bust no matter even if you took second or third place in the main event not winning it is devastating, and I won a good amount of money. And anyone else who's cashed in the main event will tell you they're the saddest people in Vegas to win that much money that night. And then the next day or two, however long it takes them to get over it, you know they're they're feeling pretty good about about their performance and the money and all that. But everyone's searching for that bracelet, and now that I have one, I it's a completely it, different. Experience. I forget about it every few minutes, so it's like a resurgence of of like, uh, oh my god, oh my god, oh <laughs> it's my happening. God. I don't even care if it's in the bank yet. It's there. I've got no, the bracelet. No, I, I know. It's, it's just amazing. And the bracelet is... I saw a guy... Actually, I played with a guy on day one with a bracelet from, re, from something he won a few years ago. And I was like, oh, man, that would be cool. See you next year oh, when he has his and he's just there. Well, I wanted to talk to you about... I'll there were... baby Bjorn on by I then. was thinking the same thing, too. I'm they like, allow babies us. in here? <laughs> yeah, no, we'll gosh, find out. No. They definitely don't, but you'll have that... I, I always say that you have like the get married run good and the new baby run good, Dude. so <laughs> next year is going to be crazy for you. I was hoping on that run good too, and it's real. Yeah. No. Birthday run good, wedding run good, and uh, and baby run good. Ship it to Papa. Now, before I let you go, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about there. There were some spots where things could have gone very different for you, yeah. and there were definitely some tough opponents. Um, specifically with Smith, you got in a couple of spots, mm -hmm. and I wanted you to just kind of, for those who missed it, talk us through a little bit about those hands, those moments, yeah. what the emotions were like for you. Well, I was grinding it out uh, with uh, with with Jeff a lot for a couple of days, and. Um, at the end of day two, I was just grinding like three and a half, four million, and the blinds are so high. It's not a traditional, oh, I have eight bigs, so I'm just going to jam. I mean, everyone was pretty much short because we were, you know, the turbo made it crazy. And so, um, and on and the end of day two, someone on the button opened up for a massive 2.8 million raise, which is a major over, over raise. Uh, he goes all in for about five million. I look down at Queens, I have about four million. I stick it right in. The other guy tanks because obviously he was kind of messing around. He ends up calling with ace-10. Queens held up and I tripled up. And from there, I really took The 2.8 million Razor had ace-10. He had ace-10 and he ended up putting it in because there's only maybe a few million more to him. So um, the Queens held up there and I ended up being chip leader going into day three with 11 left. And I took a couple, I actually doubled up a short stack, the same guy twice early on, got unlucky. And then it didn't really bother me. I just weathered it, picked up my chips back and then um, just was chip leader going into the final table, or at least top two, and then it kind of went up and down for a while between me and, and Jeff, and I think just between me and him. And then we started taking people out, and then we let some other people do some work for us, and then uh, I got real lucky with Jeff when we were three-handed, <laughs> when we got into a raising war and he had aces, and I had ace queen, and I four bet all in, and he snap called, obviously, and I was like, oh boy, this is the end, I'm gonna take third. And I was the last person to see the cards because I'm on the right side of the dealer and my rail is on the left, right? So the cards come out and before I could see them, I hear, okay, there's one. I'm like, oh, okay, there's some magic there. And right on the turn, bam, a queen. Sweat, sweat. And I'm like, oh, as long as the case ace doesn't come out on the river here, I'm pretty good. And it didn't. And uh, another explosion from the rail to be get like 80 or 90 or 100 million chips going heads up. And then within a half hour, it was, it was over. So in that moment, you know, in those sort of turning point moments where it can go one way or the other, when you go from full on panic to hope and then to, you know, ultimately joy, yeah. did you feel like, okay, this one's this one's going my way for sure? Yeah, once I beat uh, Jeff in that one uh, with the Queens, or with the, um, what do we have? Oh, in the last time we had Ace, oh, actually in the last time where I took him out, I had Ace King and he had Queens and I ended up flopping an Ace. To, so Queens only work for you in this tournament? Yeah, Queens are were money <laughs> for me only. And then I got it with Ace King. So, but yeah, it was great, and I thought he made a move on me in day two, and then we talked about it later, and I had so much respect for him, and I thought he was the best player left in the field, and, uh, you know, obviously I wanted to win, but it would have been a cool heads-up battle. It made it a little bit easier for me, I thought, um, but, um, yeah, hats off to him. I thought he played a great game, and he was very, very methodical and well put together, so it was good to have someone who I respected before I even got to the final table follow me to the final table, and, you know, we were able to play together, so that was awesome. Well, finally, before I let you go, you know, speaking of queens, this was a tournament of queens for you. Let us just say that someday in the future, your daughter is watching this video. Yeah. What do you What do you want to say to the coming kiddo? Don't ever come to Las Vegas. <laughs> I see people here with kids all the time. You're not going to be one of them.
too many bad things. Maybe when you're 40, I'll be a lot older, but I'll still show you this video. I love you. No dating, no Las Vegas, yeah. but a huge congratulations and hopefully a solid college fund for you. Now, this is actually not on our list, but um, since we do, in fact, need to answer a couple of things from yeah. the chat, Joe Bradley wanted to know, who do you think will win Poker Player of the Year? Who will pull it out? We've talked pretty um, extensively about this, as obviously it's uh, something which causes a lot of controversy every year. <laughs> right now, Dan Zak is still, yeah. he came out, you know, out running right away. He's still in the lead. Everything under first place so far has, has oscillated back and forth a, a bunch of times, but certainly right now he's the man leading the way. But I think actually almost all of our predictions are totally possible at this point. Danny Negreanu, yeah. totally possible. Sean Deep, totally possible. Ben Yu, totally possible. Even Cal Anderson, whom I put, I mean, really, basically everyone that we've said has either final tabled or come extremely close in several events, and so it's really anyone's game. Yeah, right? so for now, everybody is chasing Dan Zak, and Dan Zak, by the way, has chips uh, at the time that we're recording this. 54 players are left in the 1K, and he has a below average stack, but he's still in the mix there, according to the latest reporting from Poker News. So he's in the best shape, but like, just like Sarah said, there are... 20 people who could win a bracelet tomorrow who would overtake him because of their previous caches. So the summer is still wide, wide, wide open. Um, we haven't had anybody final table two events, I don't think. Zach had the first and then a little off of final table. Um, he's just had some field bonuses, which is good for that 25K fantasy. Um, so it, wide, wide, wide open race. Well, we, of course, always love... And when I say we, I mean me for sure. Always love talking about the drama. Always love talking yeah. about the controversy. Yesterday, I caught up with Alan Kessler, who we all know is the, uh, should I say structure police? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what's <laughs> the best best way to describe it. But there's been a lot of talk about the structure in the 1500 limit events, but also a lot of talk about the structure in the championship events, which mm -hmm. have all basically moved to four days. Right. Tell me what you're hearing. And so... The 1500 mixed events also have moved four days. Some of that is to accommodate the streaming of that final day. So when there's a final six, either CBS All Access or Poker Go can be like, boom, six players come out, the stream starts at one. All, that's it. That's all we have to say. Whereas last year, you know, some tournaments like didn't get to the final table until like five, six, seven o'clock at night. They had to kind of adjust on the fly. So this was definitely safer for the streaming. And then a four-day tournament obviously will make the uh, the structure will be better, but key key but here is that the pros, some of the some of the big-time pros don't want to spend four days in a fifteen hundred dollar mixed game event, right? Like they know and love it. They're here for the love of the game, and that's why they're firing it off to begin with. But they don't if, even want to spend four days in a ten k championship. Exactly, event. exactly, exactly. So if you took four days for the pros in a championship event and they're tired of that imagine what they're going to be like for a 1500 so you see guys like christopher vich like david odb baker who are sitting out these events and they would have never even considered that last year so there's clearly a problem there's obviously a balance that has to be weighed i'm sure kessler is excited about these structures but you have to you know this is a process so you have to tweak it even more for next year and i'm sure that that's something they will do yeah, it's, and it's interesting when, you know, something else that I think the players have to at least recognize or consider is the fact that when we are doing the live streams or when streams are happening, schedule shifts are also going to have to happen. Sometimes things that were going to be yeah. three days are now going to be four, yeah. sometimes uh, vice versa. But it's interesting for ODB because a lot of the controversy was coming because I thought people were saying that ODB had helped design the structures for the 10Ks, yeah. but then this was like making people miss other things that they didn't want to. And I think really the... The bottom line is that it's just impossible to make everyone happy all the time. Yeah, that's so true. And we're always trying to adjust. We're always trying to, to to mix things up. But it's like, do you want better structures? Do you want, like, turbo structures? There's a little mix of all of them in there. And I think, especially with the the higher variance games or with, like, some of the mixed games, it's it's really hard to tell what's the most plus EV things for, for yeah, players. Yeah, that's true. And props to the WSOP because they listen to ODB and they've already started to implement some of his ideas in their structures now, so they've changed things up a little bit. I'm not sure on the specifics. Uh, Jefferson, you're right. Chance Corneth does have two final tables. I mean, I talked to him, like, 18 times uh, over the course of those two days, so I should have known that. He final tabled the 50K high roller and the 10K short deck, so there's another player who is pretty live for uh, Player of the Year. I think they'll find the right-ish balance eventually. It's just it's a really tough 
job because you have to appease to the amateurs and to the pros at the same time. It's just like it's just it's just tough Absolutely. to do. But I think they're on the right track. And speaking of that, actually, something that they just released today is that the World Series of Poker is actually adding an event to the schedule, which I, for one, I've never seen this in the history of me coming here in nine or ten years. Maybe I missed something, but uh, I can't remember them ever adding once the schedule had already been released. But they're adding a $50,000 high roller, which they're calling, what are they calling it? The final 50 or yep. final, <laughs> final 50? Come on, yeah. you know we want it to be called that. The final 50 high roller, which basically came as a response to some of the high rollers complaining that the 50 was way too early in the schedule they didn't get to play it and also questions as to why the tw there was no 25k in the schedule yeah and so Seth Polanski and you guys can read up on this on pokernews.com I believe it was yeah it was Valerie who wrote this article said our 50k to start the series remember they usually start the series with a 50 or 100k or they at least had the last couple years he says it was too early in the schedule so a lot of the guys who would be playing had not necessarily arrived in Vegas yet so they wanted to throw one of these in the mix and then they just didn't have a 25k i don't i can't imagine them overlooking it i think this is just you know eh, excuse is a strong word but a reason for them to put this 50k on the schedule is that they're like oh we didn't have a 25k we can throw that 50k in the mix and you know potentially a bunch of players said hey can we get another 50k and the World Series said, we don't usually do this, but sure. But I mean, sure. it makes it makes sense. Like, it's it's a good marketing tool. Um, it's going on during the main event, so obviously it won't receive that much prestige as the 50K high roller to start the series did. But, you know, all these guys want to fire off on a 50K with 40-minute blind levels. So that's that's what's going to happen. I'm with you, and I you know I think when you're... I, I'm not 100% sure what the rake is on a, on a 50K, but I'm sure that they're, that it makes it a lot more worth it to just toss in like a, you know, yeah, you don't need yeah, that many yeah. tables, you don't need right. that many dealers, but you're going to you're gonna get paid for sure. Although it's interesting because I think there was some discussion about this, I want to say last year, maybe the years prior. So you and I have discussed the Super High Roller Bowl moving to December this year, mm -hmm. where in the years before this, it was in May. And I think so as a result, all the high rollers were here already in may years yeah, previous that's a great point. and so i you know maybe they just didn't come maybe the 50k wasn't worth it to come and all we have to say to that is how rich how rich that's like ali missing the start of the 50k high roller final yes. table just how rich it's yes. just whatever like no it's big deal 50k now this though has sparked a whole other controversy yeah. which i don't know i, I actually am I try to stay out of the fantasy thing as much as I can. I know there's been several dramas already, which involve <laughs> the the, it's the 25k fantasy, yeah. you know, uh, which happens right before the World Series starts. They do a whole draft, people pick teams. It's like full on. It's I think did Daniel start it? I don't oh, remember who maybe, started maybe this, he but did. this he is, seems to kind of sort of run it. Yeah, right? this has become definitely one of the the. It, it causes so many side bets, so many prop yeah. bets. There's so much action going on in the 25K fantasy that I think it really does affect the way that poker players come into and play the WSOP. In yeah, fact, yeah, I agree. even talking to Alan Kessler yesterday, he said that Sean Deeb, who's never really been Alan Kessler's biggest fan, has actually made a bet on him against several other players and has a ton of money on Kessler in the fantasy draft aside from his actual fantasy yeah. draft team and yeah so there's I mean there's always a lot of action on the side and so this addition of the 50k how are players reacting yeah it's it's different the people on both sides of the aisle here this tweet from Daniel Negreanu sums it all up he says 25k draft rule says every open bracelet event counts players draft teams at the start of the world series of poker a no limit hold'em event is added to the schedule after the fact benefiting some teams and hurting others should the event count for the fantasy league and after 5,427 votes on twitter 50 percent say yes 50 mm. percent say no right down the middle and it really does seem like it's right down the middle with all the the guys who play 25k fantasy it's unbelievable okay. i think negranu is for it and Justin Bonomo is also for it, so I feel like if Negreanu and Bonomo agree on something, Everyone that should, should be, be the right side. <laughs> no, yeah. no. But I think they're going to take it to the, to arbitration. No, uh, for this I one. say no way. And Why? actually, it's because it's the same. It's the same reason when I'm thinking about who I think is going to be Player of the Year. There are okay. so many things which affect my decision, which uh -huh. have mostly to do with what are the possible tournaments that can be scheduled in that. If, so, you know, it's not who's the best poker player. It's not who. When you're looking at a point system and you're looking at a field that's a $50,000 high roller, this is 
clearly going to affect. There's a small field, which we've talked about before, maybe 50 to 100 players that yeah. regularly play these high rollers. And I think if you add even just one event to something like that, of course, it's with these micro edges that players are always trying to figure out in any spot, it's definitely going to change who the players are going to be that you would draft if you're looking to draft the HRs. Oh, Jeff's going to give me the other side. Let's well, hear it. I just, and what do you guys think? I feel like if there were a rule that said these teams will participate and play for points within the 89 events of the 2019 World Series of Poker, then I'd be with you. The rules say every open bracelet event counts. This is a 50k high roller open bracelet event. So you think so it's fine? Just, I'm just going by the rules. Okay, I, would I it think, have affected your team picks? No, because I, I think when you just add one tournament, like you said, this whole high roller tournament series is a game of micro edges. So over the course of a year, the more and more tournaments that these guys can play, the better for them. One no limit hold'em high roller being added, a small field event, at, if you were to tell me before the series started this would be in place, I really wouldn't tweak my, I'd still look for some more mixed games guys here and there. I don't think I could alter my draft strategy based off of one event. But see, my argument to that would be then you specifically would have to extra weight these small group of players uh -huh. that are mixed game players who also play all the high rollers. So then you're like specifically weighting Steven Chidwick. You're specifically weighting... I, I mean, I'm trying to think of who, who are the like maybe... 15 players who consistently play the No Limit Hold'em High Rollers who also are going to play and be really good at all the mixed games. I think it makes a difference. And who's going to be the ultimate deciding factor? Is there like a board? But is Steven Chidwick any lower or higher on your board? He's, like, to me, he's more expensive if mm -hmm. this tournament if is one more in the calendar. Game? Yeah. That's, that's a fair point. I mean, I... I think that obviously a ton of variance goes into the 25k fantasy as a whole and it depends on how your players run. Um, this to me looks like it's part luck of the draw that you're a little luckier if you have some of the high rollers and you're a little unlucky if your team is not full of no limit hold'em guys. I don't, it's, it's, a tricky, it's, it's such a tricky spot that that's why I keep reverting back to this is what the rules of the 25k fantasy says. Mm. Like this is the rule. I, I it's not. I can't possibly oh, disagree like with your guy. argument. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's exactly. like, I'm sorry. It's and gonna cost I'm like, us. Well, rule 37. It's, on page it's a 16B. corporate policy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can't make it happen for you. Um, and I want to say, you're right, Jefferson. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I'm with what, you. What do you Jefferson guys think? What says is the it wasn't on the schedule? Shouldn't, shouldn't count. count. That's fair. Like I can't argue any of the points that you are making. I, I'm just pointing to the rule book because why not? I can also kind of see the argument just a little bit that Here right the fa that fantasy the fantasy draft in the same way that poker is a game of skill yeah. it's also a game of luck and yeah. so okay this is maybe just like luck but it's also not luck because how many of the players okay and not that they would ever do this or this is actually a thing but let's just say how many of the players that are going to play the 50k are also invested in the 25k fantasy draft and these players complaining is what gets the 25k fantasy draft on the schedule yeah. i think with all the like in addition to the money that's actually in the fantasy draft there's just so much money on the side that i'm like this is really affecting a lot of people and i'm just really it surprises me actually yeah. that anything is so equally divided i i it's great, Jeff. I it's just great. love it you when love we any have kind these of controversy. <laughs> any kind of argument. Uh, ben says Jeff loves the rules. What a nerd. Ben Ludlow, by the way, he's playing day three of the marathon and should be hyper focused on a massive stack in a crazy tournament. So I don't know whether to thank him for taking the time to listen to us, yeah, or to admonish him and be like, dude. Go play, go play a tournament. Go Get lock your head in. in the game. Let's go. What didn't Ben go super deep in something last year? Um, probably not. No, but he's, <laughs> he's made, he, he has he has made a World Series of Poker final table before. Okay. Uh, I do believe he cashed the big fifty, mm. and he's in the money here in the marathon. He's a guy to look out for. Very. How uh, rich. And he was part of that stand-up comedian group at the Gavin Smith show, at the show in the Bahamas. So look out. I mean, the stock's still low on Ben. No offense. And let low, you know, mm -hmm, and get mm -hmm. it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, puns. And so Always I would recommend poker. buying. I would recommend buying a lot of Ben Ludlow stock. I love it. So there you go. 
Oh, Ben, of course, is with Jeff. And then he agrees with me. But he's probably like not going to. friends or something. He's not yeah. going to agree with you after he hears what you had to say. Yeah, that's true. Uh, okay, well, I, I guess we'll have to leave it up to our audience, and maybe we will have our own Twitter poll, which we'll get to in a couple days, where you guys will yeah. tell us what you think, what the Poker News podcast family thinks. Now, I, in fact, have to go back and do tons uh, more work. I haven't seen Alan Cunningham, or Cunningham, by the way. I have seen a few other players, though, that I hadn't seen in a long time. Uh, but before we go, I wanted to go ahead and leave you guys with, we spoke a little bit about the 10K Heads Up and what an awesome, prestigious event. I spoke a little bit about Cord Garcia, who is mm-hmm. someone who I really see on the up and up. He's he's coaching a lot of players that we see that are really sick. He's getting coaches from some of the best players in the game. He's just continually getting better and better and better and to see him go as deep as he did in the 10k heads up i wanted to talk to him a little bit and and get his perspective on you know is he is he now like a 10k kind of guy and is he like working on heads up what's going on with him so let's let's check out what the boy cord garcia had to say i've never been out of the country so it was something that i kind of wanted to I always wanted to do, but I was really good at procrastinating on. So Standard poker player. Yes. Um, it seemed like it was that time um, I was ready. And, yeah, I found some, like, success immediately. So that was obviously super cool. And um, I just wanted to, like, see more of the world. I've been only in America my whole life. So it just made sense. And I'm glad I did it. Well, I, for one, was surprised when I came last week, you know, the – the 10K Heads Up, the Heads Up Championship is always one of the most prestigious events. I think anybody who loves poker is always, you know, looking at this event to see the cream of the crop rise to the top. And I was super excited to see you deep, deep in this event. And, you know, it's not something that I normally would say, oh, yeah, Cord Garcia, like, Heads Up Specialist in a 10K. That makes sense. So what's been going on with you? Is it like, did you just decide to fire this? What's Have you been working on your Heads Up game? I always wanted to play this one. Um, 10K is obviously a lot. And when I was younger, it didn't make sense financially and probably experience-wise, too. Um, but I played a ton of Heads Up Sit and Goes and Sit and Goes through my youth. Um, super comfortable. Super confident heads up. Um, when I get to the end of tournaments, I don't have many seconds on my hand in, so um, I feel really confident heads up. And I always wanted to play this one, and yeah, just felt like the time was right, and it was smooth. I won five matches. Uh, I lost the sixth in the semis, so I ended up taking like the third, fourth place tier, which was pretty good. Um, I'm definitely content, but I also was really close to a bracelet again, so. That part kind of hurt. And also, I got in the Thunderdome for the second time, and I didn't close, so my success rate isn't 100% now. It's 50. So now I need to get in there and, you know, boost it up a little bit more, you know? Also like a true poker player. Spoken like a true poker gotta player. Win, gotta win. Well, as as the man who took down the, the OG Colossus, talk to me a little bit. Give me your perspective on what this big 50, <laughs> what does the big 50 mean for poker? Man, it was cool because obviously the – they did. They surpassed my record, which was 22,000 and change. They got like 28,000 um, entrance, so that was cool. I only played like twice because I was playing like the 10K Super Turbo Bounty. I was playing other things, and I just didn't want to invest too many t- too much time into that. Um, but it's great. It's great for poker. Um, we see that we can keep breaking records, which is cool. Um, $500 buy-in, and you get seven figures. Like, how can you complain? It's great. It's definitely in my wheelhouse and in my price range, so I certainly am yeah, not going to complain. Gotta get, we got to get you in there. <laughs> we got to. Well, speaking of, it seems like you're firing, you know, I mean, like any great poker player, you're continuing to fire bigger and bigger tournaments. You're continuing to, I think, the the echelon of players and community that you're around just continues to get bigger and better. So what's kind of the next things on your horizon? What does your schedule look like for this summer? What, what are the next goals for Cord Garcia? I don't want to, like, I don't know. I'm playing a lot. Um, playing everything that I think is good for me. Anything uh, 10K and under. Um, I'll probably play the 25K PLO. Uh, maybe Saddy into some bigger things. 50K if they have some Saddies. I don't know. Um, I'm getting comfortable playing at the nosebleeds. I don't have too much experience, but I know some of the players that have climbed up the ranks. Uh, I'm close with Foxen and Reese, and they, I've watched them do it, and I've played with them on, on the circuit over the years. So. I know it's attainable. I just like I just have to put in the effort and put in the volume, and we'll see what happens. You know. So in firing the PLO, of course, I think for most of us, and for me especially, I think of you as a crusher in no limit. Do you think that a lot of these guys who you included, who are crushing the no limit games, are now just also starting to move into and crush the PLO? Uh, yeah, PLO is more fun. Um, 
I grew up on, I mean, you know, I'm from Texas. We played PLO, like, really heavy out there. So, yeah. I mean, it, for me, it's it's kind of like I'm super comfortable playing PLO. So the 25K is kind of like in the same category for the 10K heads up for me. Like, it's something that in the past didn't make financial sense. And now I feel like I'm comfortable enough to play at that level and confident. So, like, let's let it rip. See, and you said you're living in L.A. now, which, because I would say for a lot of players, it's if you're in the U.S. and you're not able to play PLO online, the WSOP is one of the only places used to be where you could find PLO games, but you find are they, they're spreading them kind of now all over the place. Yeah, PLO is becoming more popular overall. Um, that's super cool because I think it's a more fun game than No Limit all the time, every day, no matter what. So, um, yeah, or any other mixed game for that matter. I'm starting to learn other mixed games, and so, so, so you might see me in those. Maybe not so much this year because I'm going to focus on No Limit, but... Definitely in the series in the future to come, I'm going to be playing all the mixed. And finally, before I let you go, what was the real impetus for the move to the City of Angels? Uh, I love L.A. It's expensive. There's a lot of people. There's no room, but it's great. It's something. It's somewhere where I always was happy when I went to travel. So it was a good lifestyle for me, and um, it just made sense for me. I've been in Texas my whole life. It's somewhere that I knew I liked. So... Texas forever, just saying. I'm always a Texas boy, so <laughs> let's not get that twisted. I'm going to go back. Um, I will probably end up having a house there one day, but for now, right now, I'll finish down my 20s in L.A. and see what happens. If you're with us live, you, yeah, you don't cool. have What's to. Up? But I have to duly note what time it is And if you're now. with us live, I'm going to ask Sarah if we should include the sponsorship read for Odds Checker. Oh, my gosh. I guess we should. I guess. 27 minutes and They're 30 giving seconds. away a main event seat. 27.30. Okay, yeah. So, when we welcome everyone back, mm. I love Cord Garcia. I love to see him do well. And, uh, you know, I always, there's something, I feel like I'm the old maid of this poker game. <laughs> and seeing these guys go from being 20-somethings to moving into their 30s, just watching them evolve both as poker players and as people is, is something I I really enjoy and we got to give a shout out to our final sponsors odd checker a sports betting site we'll throw to them but basically you have the opportunity to win a main event seat before the end of this June I'm fairly certain but let's let's toss out to our boys okay so something like that nailed it yeah I'm pretty sure I'm gonna have to edit this actually because we need it so fast because we are like in Quick the zone turnaround. In the moment, you guys, we Three do everything. Times a week. Thank you guys so much for joining us. We super appreciate it. We're going to be doing this as often as we can. Jeff and I getting together, and we honestly having you guys all here with us is uh, really fun, actually. Yeah, thank you and all like, very much for commenting, being involved in the conversation. That makes it more fun for us too when it can be all sorts of interactive. Not that we tire of each other. Mm -mm, it's just nice. The more, the more, the merrier. You know, and come on to the. Uh, East Stars Lounge or Sage or whatever we call this Get in the yourself pavilion. a yerba mate. Or a yerba mate yerba and mate. say what's up. Maybe we should just start doing this as a stream. Okay, if you're out there and you're listening in the audio verse, let us know that you're out there because if you're not, maybe we're just going to start streaming because that's the future of the world. That's and true. the audio thing takes me a really long time. Mainly that. <laughs> also that. The deuces. <laughs>